This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to worship at Christ United Methodist Church here in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. We welcome all of you, wherever you may be this day, to this service of worship on the second Sunday of Advent. If you've been uh, worshiping with us regularly, week in and week out, uh, you may notice that uh, the worship space has undergone a wonderful transformation this day. Our Christmas tree, the nativity, our Advent wreath, the pyramids. I give thanks for Terry Woodfin, Jennifer Christianberry, uh, and many others who are part of the staff who are part of helping to transform this space that it might help us tell the story of Advent. I certainly hope that you have had a chance to receive the Advent mailing from the church by now. If you haven't or something's wrong with it or you need one, uh, please contact the church and we'll be happy to send that along. It contains uh, many of the materials that you're going to need to follow along in the season of Advent with our theme, Let There Be. Last week it was Let There Be Hope. Today, Let There Be Peace. Also, don't forget, during the season of Advent, on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m., preceding this service, there's a class, a, a study, small group experience, uh, titled Incarnation. I invite you to join us with the Zoom link, that is, Zoom link that's provided in the weekly e-blast. Also, uh, midweek on Wednesdays at noon, we're offering a midday Advent prayer, and that link is also uh, in the weekly e-blast. On the mission front, we continue to work with the Scholastic Learning Center across Chapel Hill, caring for students and families uh, during this time of remote learning. Uh, there'll be opportunities for you to drop off your gifts on today uh, at 11 o'clock, or uh, the next one will be on Sunday, December 13th at 11 o'clock. Just a general reminder for any who haven't had a yet chance yet to turn in your commitment card that's going to help us plan for 2021. Remember, you can mail that in, you can call the church office, you can go online, you can follow the link in the e-blast. Multiple ways to do that. And once we receive your commitment, there will be a mailing that comes out that will include a, a magnet that says, Love Christ Church, for you to put on your car or your fridge to show off your love for Christ Church. Uh, those have been a little bit delayed in the mail, but they should be coming very soon. Christmas Eve. Imagine you're beginning to dream and think now that Thanksgiving has come and gone about what that's going to be like. I want you to know that we're going to be offering some special outdoor worship services on the Village Green here in Southern Village. We'll have a service at 4, at 7, and at 9 p.m. They'll be safe, they'll be socially distant, the space is going to be covered with a tent so we don't have to worry about rain or the inclement weather. You can begin making reservations now via our church website. And I want to encourage you to go ahead and do that as soon as possible. That'll help us plan, scale, and scope for what we need to do to be ready for that night. And I hope that uh, maybe even after this worship service, uh, you'll have a chance to go and make that reservation so we can plan well. Now I'm going to invite you to join in one of my favorite Advent traditions, the lighting of the Advent wreath, the marking of our progression towards Christmas. If you've got that Advent wreath at home that we've mailed to you, I want you to gather it up. Maybe gather your family around it or gather yourself around it. Get an, something that you can use to light the candles. And today you can go ahead and light the first candle. And in just a moment, we're going to be lighting the second candle. Welcome to worship. I pray that the Spirit of God dwells richly with you during this hour. God, I whispered, what if peace isn't possible? Then what? God was quiet for a minute. Then God wrapped me up in God's arms and told me a story. God said, in the beginning, I knit you together. I wove strands of peace into your heart so that you might know and grow love. And your heart was beautiful, wild, and free. That was a long time ago, but peace is part of who you are. It just gets stuck under fear, doubt, and hurt, like a bird with stones on its wings. I don't understand, I fussed. If peace is part of who we are, then why are we humans so bad at it? God held me a little tighter and said, Little bird, remember how loved you are and start small. Remove the stones of anger, hurt, and fear one at a time and peace will surely grow. Then God lifted up my arms and set me out to fly and I realized that grounded in God's love, I was beautiful and wild and free, and peace was a part of me. So I flew home and stayed up all night writing love letters and tearing down walls so that the peace in me could fly to the peace in you. 
Let me know when you get it. We light the candle of peace today as we remember God's love for us and that we are made to be people of peace. be seated. The Risen Christ invites all of us here, all of us from our living rooms and our kitchens and around kitchen tables and on sofas, all who love him and who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. So now before God and one another, we pray together our prayer of confession. Holy God, creator of all that is, donor of grace and giver of life, Hear our prayer. There are chasms in our lives, deep valleys that separate us from one another and from you. We confess that we have allowed these rifts to grow for fear of admitting our part in the separation, for fear of being rejected when we reach out. You call us to a reconciled life, to healed relationships, to a wholeness with each other and with you. Mend us, we pray, and make us new creations through the power and love of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Having confessed corporately, we now offer our individual confession in silence.
Amen. And friends, hear this good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Good morning, Christchurch kids. Welcome back. So this week we're going to be using our purple advent sheet again. If you have yours at home, run and grab it. If not, it's okay. You can still follow along. But today we're going to be talking about the Holy Family. Something incredible is going to happen in Bethlehem. On the second week in Advent, we light two candles and we remember the Holy Family. The Holy Family is on the way to Bethlehem and we are going with them. Here is Mary, the mother. Here is Joseph, the father. Here's the donkey, Mary. Mary was about to have a baby. So sometimes when going on the way to Bethlehem, she rode on the donkey. It's very hard to ride on a donkey when you're about to have a baby. So then she walked. And you know what? It's actually, it's very hard to walk when you're very pregnant and about to have a baby. So sometimes she went back to riding on the donkey. It took them a long time to get there. They must have been the last people coming up the road to Bethlehem that night. Here is the light of the prophets. Remember when we talked about the prophets pointing the way to Bethlehem. Here is the light of the Holy Family as they make their way to Bethlehem. Let's enjoy the light. Now watch, I'm going to change the light. Do you see how the light of the prophets is just in one place? I'm going to change the light so it can be in every place. Watch, do you see how the light of the mother Mary and the father Joseph is just in this one place? I'm going to change the light so that it can be in every place. Do you see how the light is not gone? We still have light in here. It's just changed. It's not in one place. Now it is spreading out, getting thinner and thinner to fill up all our rooms. Anywhere you go, you will come close to the Holy Family today. Now I wonder, I wonder what's your favorite part of the story? I wonder what's the most important part of the story. And I wonder, well, I wonder what you wonder. All right, Christchurch kids, let's pray. Lord God, we give you thanks and praise for the Holy Family. We pray that you would help us on the road to Bethlehem with them. Amen. Friends, as we prepare to receive our offering, as always, a word of thanksgiving for all the ways in which you have been incredibly generous during this year of 2020. As we prepare to um, enter into the Christmas season and uh, the new year in 2021, we would like to um, issue an invitation to help us finish strong, to help us finish out the 2020 budgetary year strong. And also, if you have not yet 
had an opportunity to fill out your pledge for 2021, we invite you to do that as well. Um, you can either call the church office and get a pledge card, or you can go online and fill it out there. God calls us to be joyfully generous. And um, even though perhaps we've not been meeting physically in this space, as we have been sharing with you, the work of the church goes on. And let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this season, for the lights and for the sounds and, and for the joy that perhaps is a little different this year, but it does remind us that we are always to be thankful in you. And we bring back a portion of all that you've given us, knowing that everything we have and everything we love comes from your generous hand. Bless these gifts that they may go to work in our world in ways that we can't even conceive of. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
Isaiah 40, one th chapters 1 through 11. Comfort, O comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her. That she has served her term, that, she, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the, of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the God shall be revealed. And all people shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of all of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather lambs in his arms, and carry them to his bosom, and gently lead the, the mother sheep. I invite you to stand in body, mind, or spirit as you are able for our gospel lesson for this, the second Sunday of Advent, from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of the one crying out in the wilderness Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. 
And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. And let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks for the gift of your word. A word that, as we hear it today, is only the beginning of the good news. We give you thanks for all the ways that you are coming to us. And pray now, O oh God, that you would make the path straight, so that your word would come to us, unstop our ears, make ready our hearts, prepare our souls to be fertile ground where your word would take root and in time bear fruit, that we might join in the work of pointing always to the one who is coming after, Jesus the Christ. Come, Holy Spirit, come, we pray. Amen. So you hear a radio spot advertising that your all-time favorite artist, band, or Broadway show is coming to town. We'll be in concert or on the stage in the coming weeks or months. What do you do? Well, I mean, in a pre-pandemic world without restrictions on large gatherings, what would you normally do? I'm guessing you'd call up some friends and family and invite them to join you. You'd go through the process of trying to obtain tickets via the phone or online or Back in the day, I had to stand in line outside the box office. Having secured the tickets, you'd block off the date and time on your calendar, and then you'd start counting down the days until the show or the performance. And finally, when the night of the performance arrives, a night unlike any other night, what do you do? Again, under normal circumstances. If you're anything like me, you leave work early, you rush home, you pick up your friends or your family, you battle traffic to get into or near the venue. You go to the security, hunt for your seats, settle in, and then what happens next? Does the artist, the band, the performers you've waited all this time and paid all this money to see come rushing out on stage and immediately blow you away? Uh, no. no. Instead, about nine out of ten times, what do you get? That's right, you get an opener. You get an opening act. More often than not, it's someone you've never heard of before, and they may, or in many cases, may not be all that entertaining. Has that ever happened to you? Can you even recall the name of some of those opening acts? Well, for me, growing up, I was introduced to a local North Carolina band as a teenager called the Connells. I fell in love with their music, and for my birthday, all I wanted was tickets to the show so that my friends and I could go. Well, my birthday's in April, and the concert wasn't until late summer, and man, counting down, waiting was so hard, finally. What seemed like an eternity, the date of the show arrived. We picked up some of my friends, we drove to Raleigh, parked, found our seats. I was so hyped, it was my first live concert ever. And what happened next? This opening act, this band named Dylan Fence took the stage. And it just made the, the wait all the much longer to hear the Connells play. But before we pile on and poo-poo all openers and opening acts everywhere, it should be stated, even if we don't always enjoy them, that openers, opening acts, hype men, have an important role to play. And just what is it? Well, for starters, a key responsibility of openers, opening acts, is to warm the audience up, loosen them up, build some excitement, some anticipation, set the mood or the tone, Maybe even encourage a little audience participation. Second, the role of the opening or opening act is to perhaps preview what's ahead, what's going to be coming. In some instances, the role requires sharing important safety information about what to do in the case of the emergencies or where the emergency exits are located. Sometimes they provide instructions like silence your phone or stay in your seat because people will be coming up and down, the performers up and down the aisle, right? Sometimes it's the job of the opener to share more about the headlining act or introduce the headlining act. 
Other instances, the opener or opening act is a local connection for a national headlining act, like a local DJ who can help personalize a bit the headliner. As you can see, even though we may not always enjoy it or look forward to it, the role of opener is important, it's necessary. Some might even argue that it's essential. The terms themselves, headliner, opener, they date back to around the 1890s. But the truth is, live music has almost always used opening acts. Lots of folks have played the part of opener, been an opening act. Performers such as Buddy Holly, Frankie Lemon, Chuck Berry, Jerry Lee Lewis, Led Zeppelin, Garth Brooks, Taylor Sweet, Swift, Post Malone. And in a world of hip-hop, there's frontman Flava Flav, right? So, of course, some of those went on to experience stardom themselves. And some along the way wore some pretty outlandish costumes, some of those openers. Flavor Flav always had a huge clock hanging around his neck. Right? To be clear, the, the job is not maybe as easy as it might appear. It's a pretty fine line to walk. Here's some definite do's and don'ts. Do as an opener. Do help promote the headliner locally. Manage the length of your set. Thank the headliner for inviting you. And stick around to help show your support for the headliner after your performance is over. Here's some don'ts. Don't show up late. Don't break the PA system. Don't share too much personal information about yourself or the headliner. And whatever you do, do not under any circumstances upstage the headliner. The best openers, best opening acts in the business know how to walk this fine line. I mentioned earlier that the term opener dates back to around the 1890s and that the concept dates back to the beginning of live musical performances. But did you know that the original opener, perhaps the first ever opening act, the one who both set and then broke forever the mold, is none other than the one who appears in our text, John the Baptizer. It's true. In and around the first century B.C., the people of God are truly living in a land of deep darkness. On them, light is not shining. They're suffering immensely under Pontius Pilate's predecessor. War, violence, the threat of violence, oppression, sickness are the norm. As a result, people feel comfortless, abandoned, forsaken, forgotten even. As the prophet Isaiah proclaims it, you heard in the text earlier, the Israelites feel like grass that's dried up, like flowers that are withering. They're longing not to be up north, but for deliverance, for comfort, for justice and peace, mercy. It's perhaps not unlike some of what we're feeling right here and now in 2020. In the wake of this terrible pandemic, in the midst of a racial awakening happening around us, working through the aftermath of a highly divisive national election, on the hills of a hurricane season that included the most named storms ever, clinging desperately to the promise of a vaccine, to a new year beginning. For the Hebrews, God's beloved, it's the promise of a long-awaited Messiah that they're holding on to. One who the prophets have promised will shed great light amid the darkness. We'll lift up every valley and make every mountain low. We'll make the rough places plain away through the wildness of the wilderness. We'll reveal the glory of the Lord. We'll comfort, feed, and gently lead the flock home again. This is what the people of God are hoping for, looking for, waiting for. And mind you, they've, they've been waiting not just for nine or ten months like we've been. They've been waiting over seven centuries, 700 years for this promise to be fulfilled. It's into this moment, this context. Suddenly and unexpectedly without warning, seemingly out of nowhere, who should suddenly appear? Not out on the lawn with a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer, but in the wilderness, an even more perplexing sight. It's none other than one of the most eccentric, eclectic characters in all the Bible. It's the forerunner in the way. It's the greatest opening act in all of history. It is, drum roll please, John the Baptizer. And he's dressed not in an ugly Christmas sweater, and not with a ginormous clock hanging around his neck, but even perhaps more preposterously in camel's hair and with the leather belt, this wild looking man feasting not on peppermint bark and kale, but locust and wild honey. 
And what does this opener, this hype man, do in the lead up to the single greatest moment in human history, the incarnation? Exactly what you would expect an opening act to do. He works to loosen up the audience, to build some anticipation. He previews what is to come, what is ahead. He announces that there is one more powerful than me that is coming after me. And he invites, of course in the other gospel accounts, he demands, jarring, but in this case invites audience participation. Offering up instruction, ensuring folks will be ready when the Messiah comes. By calling folks to participate in a baptism of repentance. Don't miss what he's asking folks to do. He's telling them to get down to the river and not just to pray, but to confess, to repent, to turn their lives in a new direction, to name all the ways they've turned away and fallen short, all the ways they've harmed one another or hurt community. Much like you'd clean up your house and prepare room for guests, John is telling them to clean up their lives, their hearts, their souls, so that when the Messiah does come, there's room for him in their lives. John the baptizer also serves as a local connection in mean, this known entity to this larger-than-life cosmic one who is coming, the Messiah. He follows all the do's and don'ts of a great opening act. He promotes the one who's more powerful. He does that locally, effectively, by crying out ahead of time. He manages the length of his set, right? We, we only hear about him in these few short verses. His time on the stage, he doesn't overdo it. He sticks around after his set to support the Messiah, the headliner, and thanks he gets for that is his own head on a silver platter. He's not late to the party. He doesn't blow out the PA system. He doesn't overshare about himself or the one who's to come. Most importantly, he doesn't upstage the headliner, the Messiah. He even goes so far as to humble himself by acknowledging, I'm not even worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandal a job traditionally assigned to the lowliest of servants in first century Israel. I mean, John the Baptist checks all the boxes of an opener, right? And at the end of the day, I'm pretty sure when John the Baptist appears in his eclectic dress, like a refugee from a Creation Day play dress rehearsal, with the munchies for locusts and wild honey, folks desperately looking for the long-awaited Messiah were perhaps a little more than disappointed. Perhaps not unlike we are when an opening act comes out, stumbles onto the stage, when we're experiencing waiting for our favorite. But John the Baptist plays his part. He plays it to a T. Plays it perfectly. And heck, the, tech point, the text points out that people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem respond to the invitation and come down to the river to be baptized. I imagine the author of the text is probably using some poetic license, a little bit of preacher exaggeration, but still, the text says all the people come out to John the baptizer. What more could you ask for from an opener? No, his name might not headline the marquee and doesn't go up in lights. He doesn't appear if in any nativity scenes as the other babe wrapped in swaddling bands born just ahead of Jesus. And yet, he is essential. He's on the front lines. He plays a tremendously important role, making a way, preparing a way, setting the stage. Sadly, as aforementioned, a little spoiler alert here, in time, John not only loses his job as the opener, but also his head at the hands of King Herod, who is grievously threatened by all this talk about the one who is more powerful, who is coming and about the ushering in of a new kingdom full of justice and mercy and peace. Not only that, but this Hame Herod will also see to it that Jesus, the Messiah, also loses his life. But not before Jesus promises to return in final victory. And not before Jesus can baptize with the Holy Spirit a merry band of followers to carry on the work of loosening the bonds of injustice, shining light to dispel the darkness Lifting up the valleys and making the mountains low, making the rough places plain, revealing the glory of the Lord, comforting, feeding, healing, leading God's people. That said, to date, this work remains unfinished. Just look around, read the headlines, listen to current events. In 2020, there remain many dark corners 
in our neighborhoods, communities, in the world. It's obvious, not every valley has been lifted up. Our world is not a level playing field for everyone. Not every mountain has been made low. Not every obstacle has been removed. The crooked clearly has not yet been made straight. There remain brutally rough edges and places in our world. The glory of the Lord has not yet been fully revealed. As we proclaim in our baptismal liturgy, evil, injustice, and oppression continue to rear their ugly heads. And as if all of that is not enough, a pandemic of disease, racism, severe weather, mental health struggles, job loss continues to ravage our communities, our nation, our world. Penultimately, we are still waiting thousands of years later for Christ to return in final victory. All of which means Christ still needs an opener, an opening act. The opening of Mark's gospel states this is the beginning of the good news, which means there is a lot more good news to come. And if we don't tell it, if we don't make a way for it, who will? There's no time to waste. Yes, the season of Advent, we talk about it being a season of waiting, but it's not a passive waiting. We need not and should not wait to respond, to react, but rather we should be proactive. There's no rule that says you have to wait till December 25th or the start of 2021, nor for Christ to come again to begin. Just like healthcare administrators and regulators aren't waiting for the approval of the vaccine to make it and ship it around the nation, but whether right here, right now, they're lining everything up so that when they're given the green light, they can immediately start. That's how we're to approach our work as openers, the opening act. The work is right here, right now. If we wait till Christmas or wait till Christ returns to start our preparation, we won't be ready. I was stopped in my tracks this week by a quote from Peter Morin, a leader alongside Dorothy Day in the Catholic Worker Movement. He said this. He said, the future will be different if, and only if, we make the present different. Hear that again. The future will be different if, and only if, we make the present different. The work must begin first within oneself. There's no need to form a committee to study the problem, the kind of work the church does best sometimes. The commandments of Christ are here before us, and all that remains is to give flesh to those words, to translate the gospel into action and attract others to the cause. Sounds like the work of an opener. It's exactly what John the Baptist was about. Precisely what we, the baptized, we've been baptized by water and the Spirit, must be about. If the future is going to be different, we must make the present different here and now. We must begin to prepare the way. And Peter's right. The work starts internally with oneself. Just like when you're on a flight, they tell you to put on your own oxygen mask first before you seek to help somebody else. We've got to do that work ourselves first so that we're ready to help others. The question, the invitation... What soul work do you need to do, do I need to do, to tend to in order to prepare Christ's room in our hearts? Confession, repentance, conditions for reconciliation and peace. What, what work do you need to do internally? And once we've done that, we can then turn outward. And there's no need to hang a large clock around your neck or put on camel's hair and a leather belt. Maybe just try donning an ugly Christmas sweater or some lights. And begin the work of crying out, pointing out, or maybe said differently, introducing Christ to your neighbor. Invite them to join online for worship. Let them know that we do this every Sunday with striking regularity. Invite them to join in. Invite them to join us for our Advent midweek prayer or maybe to our Christmas Eve services out on the green. Share some of your devotional materials or help them construct an Advent wreath. Work to learn more about one of the issues in our community, one of the issues our world is facing. The rough places and edges, the unlevel, unlevel playing field and injustices, learn something about that. Or actually go to the margins, to the valleys, those who are suffering. 
like our work with the Scholastic Learning Center that you can still support financially or volunteer in, our work with the Angel Tree, food insecurity. And as you do that good work on the margins, in the valleys, ask, why are things the way they are? And what might begin to be some remedies? And last, as we're doing some of this work, is there someone or a group that you're at odds with? One of the other assigned texts for the day, the epistle, 2 Peter, says that while we're waiting for these things to happen, and by that he means for Christ to come again, make every effort at peace and reconciliation. Make every effort at peace and reconciliation. I'm personally in the process of healing a relationship that's been strained for over two years. There's power that comes in tending to that work. Power for you, power for the other person. That then frees us up to be beautiful peacemakers in the world. What relationships in your life need healing and how can you begin that peacemaking work? If we will but tend to these holy matters, we'll be about the work of an opener, I'm confident we'll be preparing the way, making a way for peace. And no, your name, my name's not going to go up on the marquee or in lights. But that's okay. Because as the opener, it's never about us anyway. John the Baptist gets that. Let us be about the work. About the work of the opening act. So that Christ can be about his kingdom coming on earth as it is in heaven in final victory. And wow, what a Christmas encore that'll be. That the future is going to be different. It'll be because we make the present different here and now. I invite you to the work of being an opener for the one who is coming. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. We come now to a time where we pray not only for ourselves and those we know, but for those um, who are known only to God and those who are around our world. Um, I will offer the petition, Emmanuel, and we will respond, hear our praise. And let us pray. Good and gracious God, we ask today that you gather us into your presence. Draw us from this sanctuary from our living rooms, our cars, our offices, from wherever your people find themselves. Draw us in. Knit our hearts together that we might find refuge in your presence. Lord, so much of our world feels unfamiliar. You know that for many of us, we've set our tables for fewer loved ones, and out of caution had to close our doors to friends and family. Our homes, unusually quiet, don't roar with the festive sound of happy chatter and glad tidings. And God, you know the state of our holiday plans barely covers it. Your people have faced layoffs, diagnoses, and depression that we didn't expect. Your people have seen hurricanes and fires, uncertain transitions, witnessed the uncovering of widespread injustice, and woken every day for months to the reality of an ongoing pandemic. Despite the cheer our culture associates with these late months of the year, you know how easy it is for us to be discouraged, especially now. We find ourselves thinking, what is there to be grateful for? What harvest do we have to show for this year? And so, Lord, we're asking you in this moment, what do we have to be thankful for? Bring to our minds, call to our hearts, all that you have blessed us with. Emmanuel, hear our praise. We are thankful for the technologies that have connected us to our loved ones and even those with whom we have lost touch. Emmanuel, hear our praise. We're thankful for communities like this church that have kept on feeding the hungry, welcoming the stranger, and proclaiming the good news. Emmanuel, hear our praise. 
We're thankful for moments of quiet when it felt like the, peace, like the pace had slowed just a bit and we found space to take a look at the world around us, to grieve what's lost and to remember what matters most. Emmanuel, hear our praise. We're thankful for the ones who prepare a table for all of us, who with open doors welcomes each of us home. He is like the one for whom we wait and the one whose advent we eagerly seek, the one in whose name we offer these prayers and who taught us to pray saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And friends, we join now in singing our closing hymn, Wild and Lone, the Prophet's Voice. You can rise in body or spirit at this time and join in the song. give thanks that you have joined us for this time of worship and I wish peace and blessings upon you in this season of preparation I remind us Jesus needs an opener
an opening act and invites us to play that role, to make the crooked straight, the valleys raised up, the mountains low, a pathway if the future is going to be any different. It will be because we began to make the present different here and now. I invite you into that soul-tending internal work and then to the work of externally of sharing Christ. Go in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.